So if you'll open your Bibles to uh, Hebrews 2.17 first. And um, what I've done is I've put this, uh, just a part right now of the verse on my tablet. We're reading this from the King James, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And I'll, we'll continue on in a minute. But the one thing that bothered me is, you know, strange, I have gone back, and uh, you'll forgive me for saying this like this. I'm... Um, taking a closer look at the words because what I have found, sometimes we, and I do this too, if this is a perfect case in point, I will go through something in the assumption that the word that's being used in the King James truly captures the essence of something can be completely wrong. So I've actually gone back from the beginning to try and comb through to see, did I miss anything that was important to my understanding along the way? And this one word I actually caught, which it says, wherefore in all things it behooved him. Uh, I wrote down the, um, the Greek right here. And I took two translations from the 26th translation. Interestingly enough, Rotherham's translation is almost a literal at least of this, to this point, uh, using whence, and he was obligated. This is a very strange, um, we're going to talk about this word in a minute, it's a very strange word to be used here. But it is, um, you can see in other Philip's translation, it was imperative that he should, that he should, or so he, w he was obligated or it was imperative that he should what? that he should be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So let's talk about this word. And I, I, I put Rotherham's there and included Phillips because obligated is actually the, the best of words to use. Imperative is kind of comes in at second, at second best. Now, this is what is so strange about the use of this word. Um, I actually, in my notes, I put down all the references where this occurs. But just so you can know how strange th the use of this word is, it's um, Strong's 3784. And in the Strong's, this is being translated like the following, from the base of 3786, which I'll read in a minute, through the idea of accruing. That's the first, the, that's the first part of this definition. That through the idea of accruing, war for in all things with the idea of accruing. That, that might work in the case of through the ages and through time, the need that he come in attentive human flesh, flesh because what was accruing was all the sins of the people from the time that Adam sinned until God sent his only begotten son. So that's a great concept that's being defined in that word. But here's where it gets a little weird. So through the idea of accruing to owe, to be under obligation, to ought, to must, to should, to I'm reading from the Strong's, to fail in duty, to be to, to behove with one O, to be bound, debt due, to be guilty, to be indebted, must, needs, ought, O, should, see also 3786, which is accumulate, benefit, advantage, profit, gain. So two things come to my mind in, in a right translation, it is that he had to, he, not just that he ought to have, but he was obliged to, he had to be, it, it, it was imperative. And behind that, I like that the first thing is through the idea of accruing because everything was being accrued until the time that he actually did what he did, which is lay down his life, paying the price that 
we might have our sins forgiven and have life eternal restored, the concept that was lost from the beginning. So this word is kind of interesting. What's equally interesting is that it's appearing to us, this word, the Greek word for behooved, or I'm now translating obligated or imperative, um, or feeling, the Greek, occurs as a verb in the indicative. What is kind of interesting is that it's imperfect, which is a strange thing. All of this, you look at these things, and the fact that it's imperfect is a little bit strange as well, because if he was, if he was obligated in every way, you would think it would be a perfect verb. It would be perfect. It would be complete. But what's interesting is, and this ties into the train of thought, let's look at the rest of the verse. Um, let's see if I'm going to go the right way. <laughs> I wrote out the whole verse for you, which is long. But um, this is, by the way, this starting word right here, hothen, it's very interesting. Um, it's used more in Hebrews than anywhere else. It's actually not, it's stronger than gar. You know, gar in the Greek is for. This is whence, but it's, um, it's just got an interesting use to it, the way it, gar usually tends to be an explanation, so that or for, for this reason. Um, this is a, uh, it's being used as something that is, um, the technical grammar term is a hyper, coordinating conjunction, which means what comes after it is of great importance. That's the simplified way of doing it. Um, so let's do this. Whence, that's why I chose Rotherham's whence. And this is what is kind of interesting. He, he was um, obligated, obliged. It was imperative. It, all of the things I've just said, in every way, in every way, kata, panta, in every way. And we're, the word order will be a little bit different for us. Um, so uh, the brothers, which actually in word order, we'll, we'll, re -put, we'll put this back together in proper word or order. Uh, to, to become like, now this is the beautiful thing about the Greek. Remember, we, <laughs> we were, our word homologia, we had homo. But if you add this, if you add an I, and technically speaking with the omega right there, it, instead of it being the same, it becomes like, which I had previously, previously referenced was the debate of one of those councils where they discussed whether Jesus was the same homo or like homo with the I-O afterwards. Adding the I makes it like. Was he the same as God the Father and the Holy Spirit, or was he like? And that was a whole debate way back there that one day we'll talk about. But uh, every time I see this in the Greek, it reminds me of that. It's inescapable. That's something that's seared into my mind. Hina, that. So uh, to become like, to become like that. And this is what's interesting. Here we have the word for merciful. You know, when they're talking to Jesus and they say, have mercy, son of David, Ilios. We have here merciful. Merciful that he might become, or he became or become, genetai, to become. And faithful, the word order, of course, we have to put it all together afterwards, pistos, faithful. Here we have our high priest word, High priest, um, and this is a, this is very laborious. Scholars have picked this apart ad nauseum. I'm translating it in, even though it's not word for word, in things pertaining to or towards things towards tapros ton theon, in things in the things toward or facing God, to God. Ice, ice to, again, I'm going to do this for the benefit of just translating it in order to, 
here we have the uh, word from which we get helasterion, which is the mercy seat to make atonement, to make atonement. <laughs> this looks really blurry right now to me. For the sins, the sins of the people, laon, singular, so the populace, the people. Why this is important then is we can't just say it behooved him. You know, when I read that, I don't know what you think when you read it behooved him. I read it in a, in a way that suggested to me in English that it agreed with him, it became him. It, when you read that, it behooved him. I'm really not quite sure because it's, a, it's an archaic word. If translating it into modern English, it would be it became him or he desired so. But putting it in, in the mode of, now let me give you the backdrop of why this word is so fascinating to me. <laughs> We've translated that whole verse now. I mean, you can see, and we'll put it in order in a minute. But why it's so fascinating is, of course, I only wrote the scripture references. I didn't write what, what, what they are, like what, what, it, what, what is the subject matter of the scriptures. But I can immediately recognize at least um, three scriptures having to do with um, one of my favorite subjects, which is um, when I teach on forgiveness out of Matthew 18. And that word occurs, this is why I said it's a strange word, to be used right there in our verse we're looking at in Hebrews 2.17. Um, this word occurs in 18, Matthew 18.28. Uh, for owed. So I knew it was there. A sense of debt which cannot possibly carry the meaning in this Hebrews 2.17. If you see it, if you have a Bible that has um, Strong's numbers. It's uh, the word owed in verse 28. I'm just showing you how sometimes you can see stuff and you go, wait a minute, how, how does that work? How did they get, how did this happen? <laughs> so it appears again in verse 30 in the same, um, when he should pay him the debt. That's the debt is the same word, owed, the debt. See, we have it here again. Uh, oh, all that was due. The word due, that's the same word. That's all the same Greek word. Ay, 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 right? So right away, just in a few verses, you can see it has to do with, in this particular sense, it has to do with owing, debt, what is due. So it can't possibly work in that way. But when you go back to the concept of accruing, it's perfectly logical that everything was being accrued in him. So he had to take on the likeness in that sense. He, he, it was needful that he take on the, the, the likeness of us because everything that he came to do was being accrued in him and that we could go back to the Old Testament and say the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. That's, that's going way back there and all the way to the present and yet into the future. So in the sense of accruing in that way, I could accept that. But you can see how complex this is, that this one word, and that's why Rotherham's translation um, is probably the closest one. Uh, obligated. He was obligated. He had to. It was, and I, I put Phillips, it was imperative. Now you go back into that verse, read it back again, see what we did now after kind of looking at, just briefly looking at what we've done here, which is not too, too deep or too much. Try and capture everything that we've said. He was obligated, it was imperative. Things were accruing, how's that? Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. I also find that disturbing because it's, it's, he had to take on our likeness. 
that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So I'm not quite sure if this does justice by any means, but my goal wasn't to stop on the word. What I wanted to focus on, actually, is the fact that he had to take on, it was imperative that he should become like us and take up flesh. And the reason, I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to come back to looking at the verse because there's a few other things in the verse that I found interesting. But the reason why this concept, which we, we automatically take for granted because we, we read in diverse ways, specifically in the opening of John where it says that Jesus is the exegesis of God, putting God on display in a tent of human flesh. We read that, we understand it. But the necessity for him to become like us, which not only for the redeeming or redemption factor, but in the verse that follows this, 18, and in the verse that follows, uh, so 414 and 415, there's co two concepts in these two, two verses clumped together that without going too far, it's needful to understand why he had to be made like us. So we're, I'm going to come back to the verse and, and looking at the verse in a second, but we read these two things together, 2.17 and 2.18, Hebrews 2.17 and 2.18, 2.18, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to, remember that, to run to the aid of, to come to the help of them that are tempted. Now I want you to think of this, because these two verses and 4.14 and 4.15, seeing that then that we have a high, great high priest, having a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us, I'm going to do my translation, which is let us keep holding on or retaining possession of the confession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, that is, he cannot sympathize with our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Now these two verses to me are like bookends. So why I, I highlighted this, it was that he was obligated or imperative or things were accruing to take on our likeness. There's no way that he could be this type of a high priest, which is a merciful, not used of any other high priest, of any other priest, period, merciful and faithful. Now, there were, may have been many faithful priests and high priests, but never one described as merciful. And sympathetic, this word which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, which I've translated already for some that were listening, as where we get our word for sympathize. So in order to truly say that he, he can sympathize with our infirmities, he was obliged, it was necessary, it had to be that he take on our likeness. Otherwise, he could have just remained a merciful and faithful high priest, but he would not be able to sympathize and relate to our infirmities. And when you put these two verses together, there is there's almost a better depth of understanding. I know most of us read Isaiah 53 and we say the suffering servant and the Lord laid upon him and he was bruised for our transgressions and iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and we say we know all that and that's a picture of Christ, absolutely. But when you read it here and it's made a little bit more clear. I mean, this is only confirming, by the way, what Paul says in Philippians, that he thought it not robbery. Remember, he took on the form of a servant. And the same concept, except here it's more so, in that for he himself hath suffered being tempted, he's able to run to our aid to help us that are tempted. Had he not 
had he not have experienced the temptation and the things that we, we do as in our likeness, he could not know exactly, even though he's God and he knows, he could not feel the things we feel in the same way that we feel them. Hence, taking on the flesh became an absolute necessity. He was obligated to do it in that way, to, to be the perfect, absolute connection between God and the flesh, to be able to sympathize, to be able to understand. Now, I took the, these two verses, and I thought, you know, this, this will lead me down another trail at some point. But I took these two verses because I was thinking this is true when I think about how he experienced certain things. We tend to think of Jesus and we think of Jesus as uh, he's speaking the Sermon on the Mount, he's feeding the multitudes. But the passage, for example, when we read in John 11:35, where it says Jesus wept, and many people who don't understand, he was not weeping because Lazarus was dead. If you read commentaries, there's a lot of goofy things that people say. He wasn't weeping because Lazarus was dead. He was weeping because of the people's unbelief, because even, even the one that said, truly, you are the Christ, the one that's come into the world with full articulation of something, still didn't have the faith to understand who he really was, he was, if you read that passage, he wept, but he wasn't, he wasn't weeping over Lazarus. Now, there's maybe this one string here to realize that this is the, the uh, if there was one part of this you could weave in and say possibly remotely, maybe he wept because he saw this is the victory of, of the devil, but no. He wept because of their unbelief. The same thing we read elsewhere, um, I'm just, so did he experience tears? Absolutely. And we experience tears. We just experience that experience. By the way, I, I have deduced in my mind that tears are the universal language. They are far greater in their universality than love is, because love has shades of love. You can, you can love as a friend. You can love as a lover. You can love as a sister, you can, there's shades of love, but tears usually is only two forms. There's tears of joy and tears of sadness. And there's more universal language in tears than in other emotions. You go anywhere in the world, you may not be able to speak somebody's language. You may have affection for someone, but you can recognize immediately when tears are coming out of somebody's eyes. That's a language right unto itself. Jesus wept because of the people's unbelief. Now, he experienced feelings like we experience. He could have just sat there with arms folded and said, a bunch of stiff-necked rebels, didn't need to shed a tear. But he experienced the same things. He took on our flesh nature. All God, all man, he took on that nature. So when we talk about him being able to sympathize, it was necessary for him to, to be able to have complete sympathy with us. We know in our relationships, we, say, we hear someone's grief and we say, I'm sorry to hear that and I feel, I feel terrible. But you may not know the degree of where they are, so you can't really exactly say, my understanding is so complete of where you are emotionally and the pain you're going through. But there are certain things that we can say, Jesus wept, he cried over that, he wept over their unbelief. And elsewhere you read, you see the woman at the tomb and she's weeping. We know not where they've taken our Lord. She's crying, she's genuinely perplexed at where, where is the body? Two different dynamics at work, our human tears, usually the, obviously the product of pain. Usually, there's tears of joy. There's tears of joy, Luke 15, when a lost is found, tears of joy and rejoicing. But by and large, when I say he's able to sympathize, it's not just we tend to think immediately our sins and our sicknesses, but in all dimensions, tempted in every way, yet knew no sin. 
I just picked his tears as one because it, it strikes me as something that we tend to not think Jesus crying. Or another place, I think it's in Mark's Gospel where it talks about how Jesus was angry. And he was angry. In a moment he turned and he was angry. And he was angry at what the scripture says is their blind heartedness, their disbelief towards him. He was angry. You don't think of Jesus as being angry, but then you think of him going into the temple and turning over the ta table, and that's a combination of anger and good old-fashioned, uh, whatever you want to call it, Jesus elbow grease, I'm not sure. <laughs> Does he need elbow grease? Because he's God. But anyway, my point is righteous indignation. But in Mark's Gospel, it's referred to as Jesus being angry. We encounter the same emotions. Most of the time, ours is not righteous indignation. But we encounter anger. I take one last one just to say, just to give you ideas that sometimes it's always the things, we go to the obvious, but what about the not so obvious? We talk about our faith walk being sometimes difficult, where we feel alone, we feel alienated. But there could, we'll use the term forsaken, but there could not be a, a greater uh, declaration of being forsaken in understanding than Jesus on the cross saying, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? In that moment where his disciples, these that he had brought into his close proximity, that had professed absolute loyalty and they were going to stick with him, they all fled. They fulfilled the scriptures, the prophecy that he would have to tread the winepress alone and the, the sheep would scatter, but he was alone. Now he's crying out from the cross. And we, we tend to think like these are far removed concepts for us to actually see these things that we experience, Jesus did experience. Now, they're in a different light, but they're still human emotions and they're still human pains and they're still human happenings. We humans have this about us. You know, you, you say, well, yes, he was forsaken in that moment where he declared himself to be forsaken in that moment. Just as equally as Paul said, all Asia's forsaken me, only Luke is with me. And I'm sure the loneliness and the, the feeling of um, abandonment, if you will, for a person like, go back to Jeremiah, go back to David in a cave, you can see that these are human emotions to feel like what we have put ourselves in the midst of, what we have valued so much has caused us alienation. People have left us. Remember, Jesus also asked the question of these other disciples, will you also go? Are you also going to leave? And some stopped going, stopped following from that time on. So he was well acquainted with a human emotion that we experience all the day long, desertion people turning away from us because of our beliefs or because something there's something about us that causes people to go away. Well, that's why I said to you, when you understand this verse that I've just looked at and you couple it with 217 and 218 coupled with 414 and 15, gives me a real sense of comfort that there is nothing, even though I've known this through all of my faithing here and all the years, there's nothing that I will experience that he did not experience while he was in the flesh, that he did not know. We just think our, our pains are unique to us. You know, I, I know, I, I tell you, I, I will not break the confidence of what people share with me in their letters, but I read the letters that you send me people who are sad because they're alone and they're feeling sometimes of loneliness. One person that wrote me, and God bless him, because that letter came just at a perfect time for me while I was busy contemplating something. What if we had sometimes people to lean on? Then we wouldn't be so eager to run to God because it's easier to lean on the flesh first than it is to go to God. And at that moment, I began thinking of 
Isaiah 50 in verse 10. You know, just as easily as that, who's among you that is walking in darkness? You have no light. And there is what I'm saying to you. In these verses here, I have that comfort that Jesus was in darkness. Jesus experienced these things. So he's able to sympathize. Not just, oh, I know how you feel. They're there. But he experienced it. And when we talk about our sickness, he experienced it. We see that through the lenses of Isaiah 53. He experienced it. There is no disease known to us, even the unknown that we don't know, that wasn't laid upon him, if you understand Isaiah 53 properly. And the same thing with our sin and our sinning nature. Although he knew no sin, he experienced it all. It was all placed on him. So it's almost like opening up a vista of, you know, when sometimes I think, I'm going to speak for myself, I can't say for you. I go through seasons in my faith where I feel as though, yes, I know Jesus is there. I know he's here. He's with me. I know all that. But sometimes I slip into the mode of, but he can't know exactly where I am or he can't exactly feel, but that's not true. He's touched with everything that I have been touched with, just like he's touched with everything that you've been touched with. Your, your doubts, the experience of your doubts. Now, he may not have physically experienced them in his body, but he, was, he saw them with his own eyes with those that were among him, those that doubted, even those that said he was the Christ. They still didn't understand that he was able to sympathize in the fullest way with them. So this opens up the door for me to say, if you are feeling disconnected, go back and reflect on these verses a little while, and you'll see that there's a, that's a grand doorway to get reconnected. Because it's really easy to think that your, your issues, your, I just, from the, the ones that I've just chosen here tonight, the, uh, whether it's your tears, and your sorrow and pain and grief that you have in your life, uh, Jesus not only knows about it, not only has he experienced it and seen it, but he knows it. He's able to sympathize with you. And by the way, that word, which we'll get to in the coming weeks for sympathize, is only used here, twice in this book, once in Peter's writing. And if you look at that word out of the Septuagint, its use primarily in Maccabees, you'll find it has to do with uh, family, familial uh, sympathy, someone who is so close in proximity that they know the innermost depths of what it is one is dealing with. That's what I found beautiful. It's not like a word that's everywhere. So what I want to say to you tonight, whatever you're going through, Jesus knows about it. Now that, that can sound very glib and very like a blanket, like, don't worry, Jesus is in control. But if you really stop to meditate on what I've just said, you realize it's beyond just that he is connected. He had to take on the flesh. And because he took on the flesh, he's able to be touched with and sympathize with what we're going on, what's happening in our bodies, what's going on in our brains, the things that we are going through. Now, back to the text, because I told you I'd come back to the text. Let's see if I can go the right way this time. There we go. So the important thing of this word that he, he became like, I want you to just kind of see why I'm highlighting these, obligated to become like, because and I, I don't really like even to say obligated. It was imperative. He had to. It was needful. It was absolutely necessary for him to become like us. You can see that. No other high priest has been called merciful. And attached to all this is the fact that he did all this so that he could he could make atonement. Now, I'm not writing anymore. There we go. <laughs> he could make atonement for the sins of the people. 
Now don't just stop there and say, well, it ends there, because it's just like the communion, where you've got the bread and you've got the wine, you've got two things going on, because it's a complete concept. I'm saying to you, he had to become like us, to be touched in every way. That is not limited. By the way, this is just another way of looking at the communion. It cannot be limited to just our sins, because being touched in every way also means experiencing our condition of sickness and the pains that go through our body, because going back to Isaiah 53, the Lord laid that on him too which is why he had to take on, it was necessary, he was obligated to take on our likeness. If you understand that, when you read 415, it has a greater meaning. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings, which cannot sympathize with our infirmities, or our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. And that is about the best way to put the uh, period on that for the moment. I don't know why, but the Lord led me to um, open up a... Spurgeon's uh, got all, all, the, all of his teaching. And as you know, Charles Spurgeon, a great Baptist uh, preacher, famous for his Metropolitan Tabernacle and the three point, the famous Baptist three point sermon. Read all of his messages as the three points. But this sermon is out of Hebrews 2:18, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. Um, I'm just going to read at least the first portion of this, because as I began to read it, as I got into it, he's going to deal with what he calls the confirmed believer, the young beginner, and the backslider, which uh, all could be really good, but I'm, I'm really just interested in um, what he's calling the advanced Christians. That which is the most simple lesson the gospel has to teach is often the most difficult lesson for the Christian to learn. That simple lesson is that we must not look to ourselves for anything good, but we must look to the Lord alone for our righteousness. The lesson is short as well as simple. It is easy to repeat. But as often as our faith is se severely tried, we find how apt we are to forget that which is the very alpha of the gospel, its rudiments, that man in himself is wholly lost and that all his hope of help and salvation must rest on Christ that apart from God there is nothing upon which faith can fasten itself, and that, without the atoning sacrifice and justifying righteousness of Christ, the quickening and sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, and the everlasting love of the Father, there is neither joy nor peace nor comfort nor hope to be found anywhere. This seems to be a very easy lesson, yet even aged believers, when their hair is getting gray, and they are about to enter into the land of perfect peace, still find the temptation to unbelief too much for them. They begin to look for something good in the creature and to seek for happiness in themselves instead of seeking all good in God. I want to try to teach you this lesson again and also to learn it myself, for I need to learn it as much as you do, the lesson of looking away from our temptations from my own weakness and inability to repel those temptations, to him who, having himself suffered being tempted, is able to succor them that are tempted. Let us fix our eye upon the great high priest and leave Satan and his insinuations and his blasphemies and his temptations out of the question. Or rather, let, let's bring them to Christ and see all of them finished in him. I'm going to address three separate characters 
that are represented, first, the confirmed believer, secondly, the young beginner, and thirdly, the backslider. Then, summoning the attention of the whole company here assembled, I shall try to commend the comfort and instruction of the text to you all. First, let me speak to advanced Christians. You all have your trials, and those trials are of an advanced character. I love what he's going to say in here. The troubles with which the plants of God's right hand planting are assailed when they are saplings are quite inconsiderable compared to those which come upon them when they are like cedars firmly rooted. Cheer up, saints. It's going to get worse, right? He would have said that too if he would have known that. He would have said it too. As surely as our strength increases, so will our sufferings, our trials, our labors, and our temptations. This is what I love. I love this saying. I'm, this is going to be part of the things that I will remember. God's power is never given to a man to be stored up unused. And I thought about that. It's, what a simple thought, but how profound. God's power is never given to a man to be stored up unused. The heavenly food that is sent to strengthen us like the manna given to the Israelites in the wilderness is intended for immediate use. If the Lord sends you much, you shall have nothing beyond what you can use for him. Though, blessed be his holy name, if you have but a little, you shall have no lack. When the Lord puts upon our feet shoes of iron and brass, which he has promised in his ancient covenant, he intends that we should wear them and walk in them, not that we should put them in our museum and gaze upon them as curiosities. Right? If he gives us a strong hand, it is because we have a strong foe to fight with. If he gives us a great meal, like that which he gave to Elijah, it is in order that in the strength of that meal we may go for 40 days or even longer. Perhaps, my brother or sister, you are just now in great trouble. You've grown in grace, and your troubles have also grown. This is what I love, because in this day, preaching was real. It's not like today where people are telling you the garbage that is peddled as Christianity. This is the life of a Christian right here. If you've grown in grace, your troubles have also grown. You feel that you want someone to whom you can call to tell your troubles. Didn't I just say that? <laughs> your trouble very likely arises from the absence of your Lord. Let me remind you that in this respect you are very much like the Israelites in the wilderness when Moses had been absent from them for 40 days. They said, what shall we do? Our leader's gone. <laughs> he, who was a king in Jeshurun, has departed from us, and we are left like sheep without a shepherd. So they went, I dare not say, they went for that counsel, but they went to the high priest, and you remember what they had said, what they did. Alas, he gave them no good counsel, for he was unwise as they were, and as untried. He had always had Moses been by his side ever since the day the Lord had said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? He shall be to thee instead of mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. Aaron, had, this is the problem with this, Aaron had never been left without his great leader, but so in his absence he miserably failed and led the people into making and worshiping the golden calf. It's got a good point. How different will it be with you, who mourn the loss of the light in, your, in the, Lord's, of the Lord's countenance, if you go to our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ? He knows the meaning of your present trial. For he once cried, now I, this is what I, I kind of tripped out of, because I had I'd prepared all of my notes and everything, and then I read this and I said, oh, see, sometimes God will confirm something. He knows the meaning of your present trial, for he had once to cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So I, f I thought this was kind of an interesting sign from God as I picked this up going right out the door. You tell him that your soul is an exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, and he tells you that it was so also with him on that night when he was betrayed, when being in agony he prayed more earnestly that his sweat, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. No untried priest he is he. He can sympathize. He can succor. I, I love the fact that he's tied in almost everything I've just said tonight, but in his own perfect way, because he was a, an amazing orator. He had the great capability of weaving things just with a perfect flow. 
Take another case, that of Hannah, the woman of a sorrowful spirit. She was in a peculiarly trying position. Her husband's other wife had children, but she had none. Though she was greatly beloved of her husband, her adversary vexed her sorely to make her fret. Day by day this was thrown in her teeth that because of some sin, God had not granted her the desire of her heart. Sounds like some of the people I know in the church, not here, but in other churches. They say, well, because of some sin, you, on some unconfessed sin, the Lord's put this on you. Give me a break. <laughs> when people say those things, just ignore them. Just walk away from them as fast as you can. They, they, don't, they don't know what you know and what God knows. A trial in, one, in one's own house is one of the saddest places where it can come. The saddest, perhaps, with the exception of a thorn in the flesh, which comes still closer to home. So poor Hannah, having that trial at home, thought she would go up to the sanctuary in Shiloh. There she prayed unto the Lord. She wept. She vowed a vow. But she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. So Eli, the high priest, thought that she was drunken. And instead of comforting and consoling her, he spoke harshly to her, depressed and broken as her spirit was. <laughs> That's not a merciful high priest right there. That's not a sympathizing high priest right there. You, my brethren and sisters, may have some trouble which you dare not tell another, though it is sorely vexing you and threatens even to break your heart. But when you go to the great high priest, he will understand all about you. He will not need for you to explain your sorrow to him, for he knows exactly what it is. But he will apply the healing balm to your sorrowful spirit and send you on your way full of peace and comfort. Now, that's really all I wanted to read. There's much more to this sermon, but that's what I wanted to read to say to you. You know, you hear it from me, and I'm taking two, two sections of the same concept. You hear it from somebody else and you understand that if you realize he had to do this to be able to truly sympathize, not just some flattering, oh, I know what you, you're feeling or I, I, I can think I know what you're feeling, but to actually know because he had to take the flesh person to be able to, to know that, to understand it, and then to sympathize with it. So whatever you're going through, whatever you're going through, you may feel alone, and we all have our times of feeling this way. You can be surrounded by people and feel alone. I was telling that to somebody some two weeks ago, someone who's constantly around a lot of people, their whole livelihood's around people and being around lots of people. And you can be around lots of people and be alone. You can also be around lots of people and be alone and not be lonely, because you understand who's with you and who is always with you. You're never alone. You can feel alone just even for a while. And that, that moment of loneliness can leave you taking a stupid pill or saying the dumbest things regarding the status or the state you're in. But remember this. You're not alone. You have a great high priest, and I have a great high priest who can sympathize with our infirmities our weaknesses. By the way, not just it is weaknesses, not just weaknesses, every dimension of our being. Now, thank God we have that in the old dispensation. The best the priest could do was accept the sacrifice of the one offering for whatever their condition was or whatever the prescribed method was and move on. Next, we don't have that. We have a much better high priest. Thank God for that. Now, get on the telephone. Come to this house.